is not quite done with us yet. Um, as uh, I know some of you have noticed, there's a quiz up uh, due Friday 9 p.m. Uh, this quiz and next week's quiz will be of a different form. They'll be on Gradescope and uh, they won't be automatically graded, so you can still save your answers, come back to them, but uh, the the, uh, your answers will be going kind of once after the, the quiz is, is due. Uh, any any questions about that or the the final project? Uh, anything we've been looking at? Can we use play dates on quizzes? Um. So yes, you can use late days on quizzes. Um, not use late days on the final project implementation. Um, that would go to the, the Dean of Students office for an extension. Um, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, next week's quiz um, Okay, so uh, I have been told that I'm not allowed to offer extensions past the last day of class. So you can use extensions on this week's quiz, but not next week's quiz, since it is due to the last day of class. Um, uh, okay, so other piece of advice that I wanted to pass on about the final project is uh, I would recommend starting by implementing one or two basic test cases, uh, because that I think is going to help you think about what the feature you're implementing is actually like actually needs to do like what would actually demonstrate that it is correct uh, and also the only way you'll be able to tell whether what you've done is correct or not is by testing it. Uh, and so you're basically doing uh, a lab but you are also doing the test cases part and for the labs you always started with the test cases so starting with the test cases uh, for the final project at least some basic ones would be a good idea Questions on that? All right, so we have kind of two, two topics for today that both relate to um, how can we apply uh, virtualization. This idea has sort of gone throughout the entire course, so we have some, some resource. Now we have some layer on top of it that is virtualizing that resource that is allowing kind of different processes or different threads to kind of have some illusion that they have their own CPU or their own private address space. Uh, and so some sort of alternate ways or uh, uh, more in um, what kind of other useful ways to employ virtualization. So the first that I want to talk about is memory protection. Uh, so how does, like, how have we looked at uh, the operating system providing memory protection um, up to this point? In each process gets own virtual memory, but they can only access that and not from outside of that. So they keep processes from like second so. Yeah, we have isolated processes and they can only access their own memory and what what prevents them from being able to access uh, memory they're they're not supposed to. Jimmy? Yeah, that the that this address translation, this sort of intermediate step on memory access. Uh, prevents this, and uh, kind of our our kind of page tables or address translation strategy. Um, <clears throat> this uh, could we do this just um, 
could we do this uh, with a kernel on uh, any uh, on any system, or were, or were there parts of the system that were required to do our memory protection? Yeah, there was like all sorts of parts of our address translation which involved the hardware. Like for example, there's a hardware register that stores the address where the page table is, so we can find the page table in memory. Um, and uh, kind of there's a component of the CPU that is actually the memory management unit that is doing a lot of this tra address translation, walking down these multi-level page tables. Um, So kind of these strategies all involve some level of hardware support, and they were kind of a, a combined approach between software and hardware. And so, today I want to ask, well, could we provide aspects of memory protection or, or what would it look like, what would the benefits be of providing memory protection entirely through, uh, through software? So I think we can start out by brainstorming, like, what, like why would we want to potentially handle memory protection in software? Like what potential benefits might that have? So uh, take four minutes and brainstorm uh, with your neighbors, like why we might want to do this, or just kind of things we might need to keep in mind, or, or potential benefits. All right. Sounds like we're, we're ready to, to discuss some, some potential uh, reasons why we might want to do this. Anyone have an idea to get us started? Elliot? Um, it would be more portable, since you don't have to roll out. The hardware support here. Oh. Yeah, that would be a uh, a nice advantage. Like we could implement our kind of memory protection and software. Um, that's sort of a, a common environment that could be uh, run on a lot of different devices. Well, you get another layer of security because even if an application manages to escape one level of protection, you can put another. Uh, yeah, this might be this might be more uh, more secure. Um, kind of one uh, specific way in which it might be more secure is by kind of separating out this protection from as its own kind of software layer. Now the memory kind of memory accesses within the kernel are potentially subject to this same level of protection. Um, and why this might matter is you might have a de device driver's code to, to interact with some specific hardware device uh, that, it might, that might be doing bad or, or buggy things. That driver is part of the kernel, but it would be useful to have some way of like not just trusting that all its memory accesses are, are on the up and up. Other thoughts? Well, I think, I, I, maybe not, but I think it would be more flexible and like if you want to change permissions and stuff, if you want to allow, if, like, if you do want to allow things to access each other, uh, it might be easier to change that in software as opposed to hardware. Um, yeah, the, this Flexibility is, is a good point. One kind of aspect of flexibility that I want to highlight here is that we're not limited to applying this protection at just one point in the system. Meaning that we could have application level protection where maybe we have a, a, a process like a web browser that wants to be running different web pages, uh, but wants those web pages to be isolated from each other or to not be able to do bad things with memory. 
And so are kind of implemented entirely in, in software, we can just use this at kind of different points in, in our system, which uh, definitely has, has some real benefits. Any other thoughts? All right, so how would we actually uh, how would we actually, or what are some examples of this sort of software production in, in practice? Um, so kind of one way that this is uh, put into, into practice is if you have a system that is implemented kind of entirely in some, uh, in some language, then that language itself can provide some of the protections we want. So, a couple of examples. So, in the operating system kernel, uh, it has network packets arriving into the kernel, and then those are kind of passed on to some user application. But it might be very useful for the user to be able to customize how certain packets are handled by the kernel. So for example, we might want the packets not only to be sent to our, our web server, whatever our application is, but also be sent to uh, some network debugger so that we can uh, monitor kind of what's going on in the network. So we'd really like some way to have the user be able to put in this, this filter here that can affect how these how this information coming in over the network is uh, handled within the system but what would what would why wouldn't we want to just like let the user write some C code that would plug into this spot well because you don't want them to allow them to execute any arbitrary code in the kernel Exactly. Like we just let them write some kind of general purpose C code that's going to be like called for various network packets. Now they can just do arbitrary stuff in the kernel, and that's that's no good. So uh, that's where this kind of single uh, language idea comes in. Um, that we're we're going to define the the language in which the user specifies these filters is defined such that only safe filters are possible. So basically, um, we're basically going to restrict the language or design the language in which the user can specify these filters to only allow safe operations. So get back, it, it, it's kind of about the design of the language in which uh, uh, things are, are, are implemented that is going to, uh, that is going to, to give us our safety. Um, so what are these, what would these restrictions actually be? They would be things like you can only branch conditionally on the contents of the packet. You can't branch, you can't branch on any other kind of data. Hat can only be from the packets and you can't have loops. And so we say, no loops, we're not going to get stuck in some infinite loop in this packet filter and uh, grind the kernel to a halt. We're only branching on packet data, so we're not able to do arbitrary things based on contents of memory. And uh, these are the sort of restrictions that would mean kind of we're removing the possibility of unsafe things happening in the kernel with this user supply chain. Does that make sense? Questions on that? I'm just curious, because I had the chance to use a packet filter system recently that required that everything be deterministic. Is that all packet filters using this kind of system, or was that just 
Because I, I guess I'm wondering if they're like fully like Turing complete or whether mm -hmm. like it makes sense that like like can that yeah sorry I mean yeah so it would certainly be possible to design a packet filtering language that is not Turing complete that cannot just uh, compute arbitrary programs. I don't know off the top of my head if, like, in general, packet filtering <clears throat> languages are, are Turing complete or not. Uh, my guess would be yes, some of them, some of them might be. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, e if, if they can do arbit arbitrary computation, it would require, like, some very specific sequence of, of network packets and, and, and outputs and kind of, it wouldn't be like just writing a C program. Other questions? All right, another example of this sort of single language system is uh, JavaScript, uh, which used to uh, execute code uh, on web pages. And we have uh, an issue to consider because the, this JavaScript code for web pages running on the client's machine and so it's very important that if I go uh, uh, if I go to like uh, malware.info that it can't just own my machine, grab whatever contents of the hard drive it wants, steal my passwords, whatever. This code running on the local machine needs to be um, used to be sandboxed is how it's often described. Basically, we give JavaScript its own kind of little sandbox to play in, and it can't go outside the sandbox. Uh, it can't go and do, uh, do things that we don't want it to do. And so this is typically JavaScript is running in an interpreter, so kind of each JavaScript operation kind of goes into the JavaScript interpreter that then kind of executes whatever that is. Um, and the interpreter is what will kind of prevent this, uh, this malicious website code from making some invalid function call or making invalid memory accesses. Like the, if JavaScript code tries to access memory that it's not allowed to, it doesn't just kind of read some random physical memory, the interpreter says, no, this uh, kind of, the, the website crashes basically, instead of just kind of getting to do what it wants. Um, so, we're successfully not trusting the mystery code that's running on some website. Uh, is there something that we do have to trust if uh, if we're going to assume that this that kind of loading up a web page is safe. Well, a browser. Yeah, more specifically than than the browser, maybe the JavaScript interpreter. Yeah, we we are we are dependent on like if this interpret if this interpreter has security vulnerabilities then we're not actually safe. Like we're trusting that this interpreter is actually going to prevent bad things from happening. Um, and sadly, it's not the case that uh, JavaScript has 100% prevented any problems from ever occurring in all of time. Um, so the idea is that we trust the interpreter, it prevents bad things, but uh, software is hard and doesn't always work. Well, I'm just curious, would it be possible to write an interpreter that can prevent something like Rohammer? Or like, is that... Like, I don't know what Rohammer is. Oh, just like, or not, like if you, I guess I was just reading a paper on it last term, like this exploit where if you organize just like 
arithmetic in a very specific way, you can like make the year four states full. So mm -hmm. I'm just, I was just curious, like in an abstract way, like whether it's possible to write an interpreter that can like prevent against something like that, or whether you can only sandbox like access to resources. Um, so I certainly could imagine an interpreter like doing a lot of overhead to like look for these particular like pattern of accesses that correspond to some exploit. Uh, and then it's just a question of, do we want to pay the performance penalty for uh, preventing these certain uh, kinds of attacks? Uh, and maybe the design decision you make is you give the user the ability to like turn on extra protection or, or not if they're worried about kind of, um, particular attacks. Um, other questions? All right, so most systems are going to use some combination of software and hardware protection. Uh, uh, for example, like interpreted code uh, is often slower than kind of code that's compiled to raw assembly. And It's very common to have uh, kind of s most of the functionality, um, like mathematical operations, um, data structures, to, to be not run through the interpreter, but have some kind of uh, <coughs> implemented in, in C++ or uh, some other uh, non-interpreted language and be kind of compiled and when the interpreter needs to kind of do any of these things, it just calls into, into one of these libraries. Um, so of course, means that these libraries are also a source of, of vulnerabilities. Um, and any uh, flaw in one of these library functions is a potential kind of vector of attack that could kind of get around this, this sandboxing. Um, so operating systems know this, and for example, Windows, when it runs a web browser, the web browser is a special kind of process with restricted permissions. Because as an operating system designer, I might know that the vast majority of, pro of uh, security issues that my users are going to have are going to come from the web. Not often are people going to be like mail the mystery uh, flash USB stick and just plug it into the computer and then you know be sad. It's going to be you know downloading some file from from the internet or or some sort of uh, um, JavaScript based attack. Uh, so uh, operating systems do actually take that into account. Um, an alternative. to our language, uh, single language system is a kind of language independent approach. So could we have some sort of language independent isolation? So, The idea here is that uh, instead of trusting compilers to uh, to be be secure, what if we just kind of isolate our our code? Um, so uh, we know that, that JavaScript. You know, we've talked about some vulnerabilities, but let's say that we do actually trust that it's sandbox. Uh, is is correct? Is there some way that we could take advantage of that to kind of have any application be similarly isolated? 
use the like sandbox as a compilation target, like WebAssembly? Yeah, we could. We could just compile literally everything to JavaScript. Like, take any application, compile it to JavaScript. JavaScript will say, you know, that's pretty safe. Um, and there are some ways in which this is where we are heading. Um, that uh, many uh, modern apps are simply, like, they look like their own app, but they're actually just a web page in a browser. This is Slack, this is Spotify. Um, it's just the open source version of Chrome, Chromium or uh, Electron, which is running, and what you're seeing is just a web page in a like web browser embedded in the application itself. So like Spotify and Slack have a web browser inside of them, and what you're seeing is like JavaScripts rendering a web page. Uh, and so we are sort of headed to this world where everything is actually just JavaScript. Uh, the notes for today link to a kind of funny talk called The Birth and Death of JavaScript. Um, spell JavaScript, but the, uh, the, the premise is it's a, it's a talk from decades in the future where apparently people pronounce it JavaScript. Um, uh, kind of going through this like uh, made up history of how we got to the point where everything is actually JavaScript. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this, although it, this might, might have some downsides, um, JavaScript might have some, some flaws, it might not be fast enough, um, it might be difficult to, not every feature we need is implemented in JavaScript. Um, uh, so, uh, we might also, have a, have a special kind of sandbox that, um, It is going to actually modify the machine instructions that our program is running uh, in order to guarantee safety. So uh, the general idea here is we're going to kind of have a ch check for potentially dangerous instructions in the executable. Um, these might be privilege instructions, these might be instructions that uh, modify particular parts of memory. And the sandbox is we'll just insert additional instructions into the executable kind of to, to check that these that these operations are safe. Um, and so uh, if we have some memory access in our, uh, in our, compi in our compiled program, um, and like where the kind of original uh, says, take the address stored in some register, uh, take the address in some register and, and store data to that location in memory. Uh, and we turn this into test that this is, test this against the um, uh, the kind of base uh, and If that it's kind of less than the base, trigger an exception, test it against our bound, and if it's greater than the bound, throw an exception, and then only after these checks do the actual store uh, in memory. So the idea is we take some potentially dangerous access and we just add a bunch of extra stuff to ensure that that is safe. Um, and like this check against base and bound, this was something that when we were talking about address translation was happening in 
that as part of the address translation process, these exceptions might have been triggered, but we're just sort of doing this in software. And the mechanism for it is we're actually inserting new instructions to existing programs in order to, to do these sort of checks. Does that make sense? All right, the last uh, thing that I want to kind of talk about on this theme of, of software protection is not JavaScript, but the language it was named for for purely commercial reasons, Java. <laughs> so uh, does anyone know what, when you compile a Java program and you have that .class file, like what is in that .class file? Well, Instructions for the Java virtual machine? Yeah, that we compile to uh, basically a, a form of assembly called Java bytecode that is instructions for another program called the Java Virtual Machine. And you can think of uh, this Java virtual machine as an interpreter for not Java, but for this um, compiled version of Java, Java bytecode. So this Java virtual machine is kind of doing the fetch, decode, and execute that a CPU would do on the Java bytecode, and then the Java virtual machine is emitting actual CPU instructions to the system to uh, uh, make, the, make the Java program run. Why would compiling to this sort of intermediate form of code, why would that give us the sort of protection or the security that we've, we've been after? Because then the Java virtual machine could uh, perform the same role as the sandbox. It would perform safety checks and restrict what memory it can access. Yeah, Jimmy? Oh, I'm, I'm just wondering, is there an actual machine that's just built to run Java program? That itself is a Java virtual uh, are you saying, is the Java virtual machine a physical machine? Like, can you build a machine that can only run Java programs? Um, well, you can, you can write a program whose job is, is to take Java bytecode as input and to then execute uh, x86 and stuff like, so there is a JVM program for x86 machines, for um, uh, for, for other CPU architectures, ARM, or, or uh, other things. Uh, and so it's just a program implemented in, um, uh, often in, in C or C++ uh, that does the job of like actually executing the Java bytecode as whatever instructions are actually used on, on where the Java code is being run. Um, but to, to, to Victor's point, um, having this, this JVM means that it can do all this sandboxing. It can do all these checks. Uh, and actually, the, when the Java compiler compiles the bytecode, it can actually insert annotations that say you need to perform this kind of check, uh, or this is, a, or, or this is a, uh, um, a kind of check to, to, um, uh, to perform here. And because our, our Java virtual machine automatically manages memory, like when there's no more references to some chunk of memory, the Java uh, will automatically free it. That also prevents a lot, of, a lot of the kinds of mischief that you can get into using C when you have more direct control over memory. Well, If the maintainers were so inclined, is that some kind of sandboxing something that could be done in LLVM, or is they like a fundamentally different type of technology? Um, I mean, as far as I'm familiar with LLVM, that's, uh, uh, I guess, I have only encountered that when compiling C to a native binary. Um, but 
this would be a, a great thing to talk about offline. Uh, other questions? So, last point on the, the JVM, there are now a lot of languages that um, actually compile to Java bytecode. So there's an implementation of Python that gets compiled to Java bytecode and then can just be run on the Java virtual machine. Um, Ruby, JavaScript, Scala, Kotlin, all of these languages have, can be compiled to, to Java bytecode. Um, and so the JVM, since its creation, has kind of become a language independent sandbox in some ways because there are all these different languages that uh, can actually be run via the Java virtual machine. Um, there's a reason that C, C++ are not in that list. It's much harder to compile these kind of closer to the hardware languages into, into, into Java bytecode. Any other questions on, on this, these software protection ideas? All right, so before we get to the other main topic for today, I want to tell you about one Herbert Hoover. So uh, this was, there had been um, Republican uh, presidents through kind of the whole, whole 1920s, um, and Harding, and then Coolidge, and then as, as I said last time, Hoover was Coolidge's Secretary of Commerce. Um, Hoover had never held any elected office before he was elected president. Um, he was part of the inaugural class at Stanford, uh, studied geology, uh, made a fortune uh, as a like uh, uh, overseeing mining operations in Australia and China, um, and then kind of getting involved into financing mining operations all over the world. Uh, and kind of after he had made a bunch of money, he got into, into public service. Um, and one of the really notable things that, that he had done is during World War I, uh, the Germans had invaded Belgium, and uh, the British and, uh, uh, and French had put in a, a naval blockade on kind of all of uh, German territory. And this meant that Belgium, which had previously imported uh, the vast majority of its food, could no longer import any food because it was blockaded. Um, it had imported it via sea, uh, and uh, the German government was not interested in diverting resources to feed Belgians. Uh, and so uh, people were worried that millions of people in Belgium, among other places, would starve during the war. And uh, Hoover was a big believer in kind of private individuals like getting together to work on solving problems, and he uh, organized an international food relief effort that was sort of recognized as, um, that, that was kind of allowed by both sides of the war, uh, and he always saw this like giant international effort that had a bunch of its own ships that was taking food from all over the world to Europe and actually prevented uh, literally millions of people from starving during the war. Um, he similarly played a, a big role during Coolidge's term of like providing relief when there was this really bad flood in, in Mississippi. So he kind of had this reputation as like this great engineer, this problem solver, um, kind of this combination of, of private uh, enterprise and, and government solving problems. So he runs for uh, for election and just crushes it. Um, uh, there's. Another thing here where, where I think Al Smith, um, former governor of New York, was the first, um, uh, I think the first uh, uh, Catholic person to get a major party nomination. So there's some uh, uh, other factors than just Hoover's popularity, but Hoover comes into office. And within a year, the US is in uh, the throes of the biggest economic collapse in world history, the Great Depression. Um, and Hoover is just totally outmatched by, uh, by this moment. Um, he, he tries to, to, to have government kind of help people in some ways, but he's a little skeptical of a lot of government intervention. There are economists after the first year or so saying, you know, things are getting better, the government can do less, and so he cuts back, but of course things weren't getting better. Um, and so by the end of his, his one term, uh, things are terrible in, in, in the U.S. Uh, people are calling the 
of en en encampments of, of people who have, who have lost their home, Hoovervilles. He gets blamed for all of this when actually in the run-up to this, he was warning against speculation on Wall Street. Um, so not exactly fair, but when he runs for re-election, uh, uh, he uh, is, is dealt a similar defeat um, to, to his defeat of, of Al Smith when Franklin Roosevelt comes in. Uh, and Roosevelt really uh, uh, lit into to Hoover in the campaign. He was like, Hoover only cares about rich people. He's like, he's doing nothing and really kind of tars, uh, tars Hoover. And so here's, uh, uh, oh, I don't have the, the picture, but uh, there it was uh, a frigid car ride as Hoover and Roosevelt like rode to the inauguration. They Hoover hated Roosevelt for the rest of his life um, and, and blamed him for his reputation, but he, you know, was was uh, active in kind of policy for for decades after that. Here's a, a picture of him much much later in life, um, and he was he uh, he sort of regained some of some of his his reputation during that, that time. Um, but uh, we'll we'll hear more about the kind of political political cunning of, of Roosevelt uh, next time. But Hoover, uh, kind of a sad story because he was. Really, just uh, unlucky in, in, in the timing of everything. All right, so we've talked about providing this this kind of protection to our systems when like virtualizing different parts of it. Like let's virtualize memory or virtualize CPU or do this virtualization in, in memory, what have you. Uh, but what if we just instead virtualized Literally everything. Uh, and not just the Java virtual machine, but just every part of the machine is virtualized, which is, which is where the, the term virtual machine comes from. And instead of having our process talk to the kernel, um, which talks to the hardware, we're instead going to have a process talk to a kernel, but that kernel is actually being run through a virtual machine And below that virtual machine is some virtual machine manager that is actually interacting with the hardware. And uh, something that, that this lets us do is this virtual machine manager can actually say, well, we can run uh, multiple virtual machines with multiple kernels and if we have one hardware uh, but now in our previous picture we have just one kernel operating on that hardware uh, now with this kind of virtual machine manager we can have multiple kernels each of which believe just like our isolated processes that they are the only thing that is talking to this hardware but actually they're talking to a virtual machine, which is talking to some layer underneath, which is talking to the hardware. What, anyone have thoughts on kind of what the benefits of moving from our kind of old picture to our new virtual machine picture might be? Okay. Yeah, we have really have uh, a lot of isolation. So we were talking about web browsers before. Uh, if you're truly paranoid, uh, you just each tab of your web browser you just run in a separate virtual machine. And so even if it completely takes over the kernel, uh, that's still like protected. You're still protected from from that getting getting totally controlled. Uh, What's that portability? Like kind of a Mac running like an M1 chip? 
I can have a virtual machine manager that can emulate uh, like Intel setup. So then I can have a Windows kernel running that believes it's talking to an Intel chip, and then the Intel chip talks to something that talks to that one. So you have like Windows on. Yeah, we have um, we have the ability to to run a uh, uh, to to kind of run a kernel that at, that maybe thinks it's talking to hardware that's different from what what is actually uh, uh, what is actually there. So yeah, we can definitely get some some portability benefits out of this. Uh, other thoughts? Maybe a downside is it looks like it would have a lot more overhead for any individual system call. Yeah, so now, uh, I mean, just there, there's more distance we have to travel, more layers we have to go through to get to the hardware. So inevitably, there's some overhead that we'll have to deal with. Um, the fortunate thing is that this, the, the virtual machines turn out to be so useful and so widely used um, that uh, hardware designers have actually added quite a bit of hardware specific support for virtualization. So, uh, Intel chips uh, have kind of specific features you can turn on uh, that allow, uh, say, a, a virtual machine to kind of talk directly to the hardware in a way that that's, um, still provides nice isolation. Um, so the, the overhead is not as bad as it used to be, um, but yeah, still definitely a concern. Like if, if, we could, if we didn't need any of the benefits of this, then yeah. Our, our original way is still gonna still gonna be preferable. Okay. Is it with, with virtual machine you can just shift like the whole entire programming yeah. environment together with the app to uh, to the customer, so it's guaranteed to work. Yes. So this, um, uh, yeah, you can you can just send kind of here is a virtual machine. So it includes like the operating system, the files, kind of everything is packaged up inside there. Uh, and this is the way a lot of cloud-based uh, services work, is that, uh, uh, <clears throat> is that these are kind of instances that are like if, if I'm using Google Docs and you're using Google Docs, um, it's not that I accidentally might overwrite some doc that's in your drive, unless we were, you know, it was some some explicitly shared thing. Is that these are all uh, kind of isolated through this virtualization? They kind of some some uh, there's some uh, server somewhere that has kind of multiple of these of these virtual machines, kind of each serving a, a particular particular. So one um, one uh, image that I would like to show you is there are kind of two uh, two ways that we might uh, be using our uh, this idea of a virtual machine. Um, there's the idea of a kind of process virtual machine where um, there's some application, uh, and uh, there's um, some kind of virtualizing software that kind of uh, hides all the underlying details of the operating system or the hardware uh, from the application. So you might uh, examples of this would be uh, the JVM, for example, the JVM is this kind of virtualizing software piece where the Java application is kind of running in this virtual machine that's just provided by another process. Um, if you ever use uh, Wine to run Windows things on Linux, or DOSBox to run MS-DOS programs on uh, Mac or, or, uh, or Windows, these are also kind of process virtual machines. There, you take some uh, some Windows application, and you want to run it on Linux. So you need some layer that like provides all the Windows system calls, and then turns turns them into the appropriate Linux system calls on the other end. Uh, does that make Does that make sense? This process virtual machine. The other, of course, is kind of the the picture I was drawing up here on the board, uh, where 
our virtualizing software is sitting between the hardware and the actual operating system. Um, uh, so our uh, operating system, uh, rather than just our, our, our application talking to the virtual machine, our operating system is also uh, issuing instructions to, uh, uh, to the virtual machine, and then that, that virtual machine is, uh, virtual machine manager is, is passing those along to the hardware. There are uh, two, two kinds of virtual machines, two, two broad categories. We have type one, um, which uh, is sort of sort of the pictures we've been looking at so far. Where our virtual machine manager is running directly on the hardware, so it's not like there's some normal operating system that is talking to the hardware. We have a system. We have a system that is just explicitly like there. The lowest level is our, our virtual machine manager, and it's specifically for kind of having a bunch of these virtual machines. Um, so the the paper that I posted is, as reading for today is about a type one. Uh, uh, virtual machine manager or, or hypervisor, as they are also called, uh, called Zen. Um, uh, the type two if our VMM is not running directly on the hardware, uh, what's the other situation we might be in? Uh, yeah, so our, our VMM might be, might just be an application running on our on our operating system. Can anyone think of an example of a, a virtual machine manager that's like this? Virtual box. Uh, yep, virtual box. Uh, that's 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 not, that's one. Can anyone think of uh, another one? Well, Docker. Um, yeah, Docker is a little different in that, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of built around, no, I, I yeah, I guess Docker would be a, uh, an example of a, of a type 2 VM. Go on. Um, yeah, so, so these, I guess, I'm thinking of these as types of system VMs, so not the sort of process uh, virtual machine, but the, the uh, one that is kind of Providing virtualization for for an entire operating system. Yeah. VMware. Uh, VMware actually has products in both of these types. Hayden. Uh, OSV. Um, uh, OSV is a is a kernel. What do we use to run OSV? Kimu. That's there we go. <laughs> Going through all the virtual machines that we don't use in this class. Um, yeah. So so Kimu is. Uh, one of these type two is just an application that you run on Mantis, but it's providing kind of a virtualized view of all the hardware that the OSV kernel uh, is interacting with. Questions on this? All right, so we've talked about some of the benefits of these um, just to uh, uh, emphasize a few points. Uh, when you boot OSV uh, in Kimu and there's a bug in the kernel, uh, what what happens? Yeah, like the, it fails to boot up in Kimu, prints out some error message. Uh, if you weren't using Kimu, you wouldn't like. You, all you could do would be to reboot the machine. Um, Kimu, you can just quit Kimu and you know, go go about go about your business. But so so developing kernels in virtual machines super useful. Um, these are also uh, another way that, that virtual machines are used. I'm developing an app. 
I want this app to be cross-platform, or on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, instead of having three separate computers sitting at, at my desk, I have one computer that runs a virtual machine for Windows, virtual machine for Mac, virtual machine for Linux. So it's very useful for that. Um, as I mentioned, cloud computing and web hosting, uh, virtual machines are, are a key part of data centers. If you have a whole kind of rack of powerful computers, um, and you don't want to dedicate a single computer to a single client request um, or, or a single connection. And so uh, each uh, physical server could be running dozens of virtual machines to kind of make the maximum possible use of the resources of that one, that one computer. Um, and some virtual machine managers actually allow what's called live migration to take a VM that's currently running in one, uh, on one machine and just ship it over to another machine. So you have like your 20 virtual machines on physical server A, the load gets too high, things start slowing down, so you take several of those and ship them over to server B and sort of seamlessly from the, the user's perspective, performance improves. Um, but you've actually just sort of, you're just literally shuffling entire operating systems between computers as needed. Uh, so this is part of the reason why these are kind of a crucial component of, of uh, data centers and, and uh, web applications that have kind of thousands or, or millions of users. So, want to uh, sketch out a couple ways in which um, our virtual machine might actually uh, achieve this, um, uh, achieve user application, execute some instruction that goes to the virtual machine and then that needs to be executed in the actual hardware somehow. Um, so, I have approach one. is what's called trap and emulate, where we have the user process, uh, and then we have the uh, guest uh, operating system. So this is like OSV running in Kimu. Um, Kimu or, or OSV thinks it has uh, user mode and kernel mode. Or running it in Kimu, would it ever actually be in kernel mode? No, why Why not? Well, hopefully they can do whatever it wants and we don't want to, we want to be unsafe. And we can be like, oh, we have everything on the disk and we don't want our, you, like virtual machine to reset that's not in the machine itself. Yeah, if we let the Kimu process um, uh, be in kernel mode, it, it would no longer be, like, we wouldn't actually have the, the, the process connections. And, yeah, I was just going to say Kimu is running in user mode. So. Yeah, Kimu is just a normal user process. It's in user mode. Uh, so if it actually needs to do something that's privileged in the hardware, uh, it can't, not directly. Um, so, uh, Kimu is actually uh, our, or, yeah, our kind of guest, um, uh, our guest <coughs> user mode um, application. Uh, when we have some privileged instruction, uh, that's going to that's the trap part of trap and emulate. That's going to, um, like our um, uh, OSV execute some privileged instruction. Uh, Kimu detects, uh, uh, like Kimu will, will, uh, will trap into, into Kimu. And kind of within Kimu, we're going to emulate the actual privileged thing that OSV is trying to do. Um, 
We don't want we don't want OSV to kind of actually switch into switch the system into kernel mode. We just want OSV to think that it is switched into kernel mode. Um, and so we go into so this is our kind of OSV. This is our Kimu or our virtual machine manager. And so we're going to emulate whatever that instruction uh, is. Um, we have some kind of virtual CPU, something that's kind of acting as the CPU within within Kimu, uh, and that's going to do uh, kind of emulate or or pretend to do whatever privilege instruction this is, uh, and then we can kind of go back into, into OSV, where OSV now kind of sees the world as if this privilege instruction had kind of happened as expected. So a strategy where our kind of virtual machine manager is kind of a, a wizard behind, behind the curtain just sort of uh, emulating or pretending um, to kind of faking all the all the instructions um, that it needs to do, and a kind of alternative is uh, instead of emulating uh, these instructions. Uh, what if we uh, translated them into a different instruction uh, that had the correct effect? Um, so, for example, there is uh, an x86 instruction, pop f, uh, which will uh, pop something off the stack uh, and change. Um, uh, if you uh, remember from 2 the condition codes or kind of other of these specialized flags within the CPU, like when this is executed in, in user mode, there are some flags that it doesn't overwrite because those are privileged. When this is executed in kernel mode, it has a slightly different effect. So we have a situation where an instruction will do different things based on whether it's in, in user or kernel mode, and our, our guest, OSV, you know, might execute this instruction in what it thinks is user mode or kernel mode. Um, and so this is an instruction that is allowed to be executed in user mode. So it wouldn't necessarily generate a trap when we, like, it's not something privileged that automatically generates this trap that we need for trap and emulate. So um, our solution is To do a kind of to do what's called a just-in-time translation. So, I have the 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 Kimu is kind of uh, uh, tracking the instructions that OSV is executing, and when it executes uh, some instruction like popf that's on its list of, of special instructions, uh, it will actually translate that into a different instruction. Uh, before it goes to execute it. Um, and this is what the Apple M1 uh, systems do in order to run x86 uh, binaries. They, uh, it will kind of just in time kind of be running the x86 binary and kind of replacing instructions or translating instructions as it goes to the the kind of ARM type instructions that the, the M1 uses. So, is this just a ton of overhead? Um, it depends. Like the, you would need to be to to use all sorts of tricks to reduce the overhead. Um, uh, like certainly, if if there are only a few instructions that you actually need to translate. Um, that would be one thing. You could kind of analyze uh, source code, like the, the compiled binary, kind of before you started running to uh, maybe 
annotated in, in some way. Uh, you could kind of speculate, like execute some things and then sort of like backtrack if it turns out they need to be translated. Um, what I can say is in practice, this, the technique they developed for the M1 is very efficient. Like the overhead appears to be pretty small, uh, at least in most cases. But yes, I, I would assume that took a tremendous amount of engineering effort in order to, to reach that level of efficiency. I'm sure it was not sort of, you know, straightforward, do a couple, slap a couple ideas in there and you're good to go. Um, all right. Uh, other questions on our binary translation or half and emulate? All right. I think that will do it for today. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow evening in the lab. Um, quiz is on grade scope. And uh, on Friday, we'll talk about uh, security. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.